Welcome to the Disorient Film Festival Japanese American Short Films Q&A with the film directors. My name is Gordon Nagayama Hall and I have the privilege of being on the board of Disorient. Uh, the five films are Hanami uh, with director Lisa Maeda, uh, Atomic Cafe, The Noisiest Corner in J-Town with directors Tad Nakamura and Akita Black, uh, Parabola with director Lee Shorten, Fugetsu Do with uh, Kaya Rose, uh, director, and Sansei Granddaughters with directors Naomi Judy Shintani and Ellen Bepp speaking, and uh, Reiko Fuji, uh, Kathy Fujioka, and Sherry Arai DeBoer are also uh, in this session. Uh, so thank you for, uh, for submitting your films uh, to Disorient. We really enjoyed them. And all of these have uh, a Japanese American theme. And so I want to jump right into uh, Hanami with director Lisa Maeda. So the focus of Hanami uh, on a child is a reminder that young children spent their formative years in internment camps uh, during World War II if they were Japanese Americans. This film beautifully captures art as a way of coping with the grim desolation, isolation, and boredom of the camps. What does Hanami offer to children and their parents today who are isolated in the COVID environment? Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, first off, I'd just like to say that the latter half of Hanami's production was completed in the early months of the pandemic. So in a way, I was beginning to bond with the film character's feelings since I was also like creating art and animating in the pandemic um, in isolation. Um, so in the contents of the film, this child is drawing and painting flowers to escape the boredom and despair of internment. And it just hit this unexpected like double emotional chord, not just because of my family's own personal history with internment, but the struggles of desolation in pandemic times. Um, but in regards to how Hanami may relate to today's children and parents uh, who are isolated because of COVID, there's sort of no two ways about it. Like these two events are very different and yet they're both a little bit traumatic to um, the children who are experiencing it. Um, in, in the contents of Hanami, this main character, she's quelling the boredom and stagnation of her day-to-day -day life through experimentation and play um, through painting these flowers with this traditional calligraphy tool. Um, and it's a fun activity for her on one level because flowers are easy and they're fun and they're forgiving to draw. Like you can't really mess up a flower, <laughs> you know. Um, but on a deeper level, it's like very meaningful, meaningful imagery for her um, since flowers are such a common motif for the Japanese identity and it sort of validates her later in the film. Um, so she's just able to sort of celebrate herself through this creative experimentation and sort of validating her own interest and identity. And I would say throughout this pandemic, I feel so much respect for Issei and Nisei who lived through internment. Um, I know it's not the same thing at all. Everyone's circumstances are different, but I just feel this small glimpse of what their lives must have been like and their, their boredom and frustration. Um, but I remember like, Americans have gotten through this before through internment, so uh, I'm inspired by them. I like that you, as I mentioned, uh, you took this through a child's eyes and uh, my mother's family uh, was at Post in Arizona in the camp there and she was 20, but she had, I think her youngest sibling was uh, about uh, nine or 10 years old at the time. And so I think sometimes we forget about all the children who are in these camps and just spent, you know, we're basically isolated and bored uh, in this desolate place, uh, similar to, you know, children who are at home now trying to do online school. So I, I thought this uh, captured that experience really quite well. And uh, I think this connects to Sansei Granddaughters, which we'll be discussing later, because there was a focus on art uh, as a way of coping. But uh, I thank you for that film. And, and it's uh, the, the animation, I guess, is your uh, preferred uh, 
mode, but d- did the animation aspect uh, uh, communicate uh, uh, communicate this message particularly well? So was I, I guess the question is, did was animation particularly suited for the message you wanted to uh, uh, send here? Yeah, for sure. Um, I personally feel like Hanami wouldn't would not flourish in a, a real life format for live action footage because there's so much effects work of the flowers literally coming to life. Um, and sort of her entire internment room is sort of decorated with all of these Japanese motifs, um, not just flowers, but also patterns. Um, and I don't know if that could necessarily be uh, replicated through live action footage. Um, I also sort of feel like the 2D animation medium is also very much connected to Japanese identity as well. So um, I felt like it was quite suited for the story I wanted to tell. Thanks, Lisa. So Lisa Maeda, uh, director of Hanami. So, so next we turn to Atomic Cafe, the noisiest corner in J-Towns with directors Tad Nakamura and Akira Bach. Uh, so my, my questions about this film, uh, about the Atomic Cafe in the 1980s in Los Angeles. How did the Atomic Cafe become so eclectic when so many other restaurants and businesses in Little Tokyo, Los Angeles, catered almost exclusively to Japanese Americans? And also, I wonder if some of the patrons of the Atomic Cafe, particularly those who are Japanese Americans, were, were scared away by this this kind of wild crowd at the Atomic Cafe. And uh, final question is, why do you think the Atomic Cafe became a hotbed for musicians in the 1980s? So please, uh, Tad and Akita, please feel free to uh, jump in on any of these questions or anything else you want to offer. So Tad and Akita. You know, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so first part of the question. Um, so the Atomic Cafe always actually um, welcomed a very diverse crowd. And if you watch the film, you'll see that, you know, some of the original customers back in the late 1940s, because the, the cafe opened in 1946, right after the war, um, were they're African Americans? They were uh, their Chicano, you know, clientele in the photos, and a lot of Japanese Americans, and that was sort of a, a byproduct, I guess, of the diverse nature of Little Tokyo at that time. Because during the war, it had actually become Bronzeville when all the Japanese Americans moved out. Well, were forced out, I should say. Um, a lot of African Americans moved in, and East LA is right over the the bridge, right there, you know, in Boyle Heights. So it just be, it, it's always been this sort of um, intersectional place, and it probably also had to do with uh, the welcoming nature of Atomic Nancy's parents who started the restaurant. Um, they just seem to be very progressive, um, and they loved music, which is why they always had a jukebox. And they're the ones that really turned on Nancy and her sister to music in the first place. Tad, you wanna? Yeah, I think, you know, like Akira said, I think it's it's very much, and, and those who don't know, you know, Little Tokyo in Los Angeles is, is located directly in downtown Los Angeles. So I think geographically, like Akita said, it's just um, all these different communities are, are close by each other. Uh, and I think, you know, I think especially with um, when Nancy took over the restaurant, um, you know, I think that Sansei generation, I mean, maybe at one time, you know, Little Tokyo might have been exclusively, uh, or at least the businesses might have catered exclusively to a Japanese American um, to customers. But I think, you know, by the time Nancy took over and just by the time kind of the Sansei generation was really um, the main um, customers, I think just generationally, I think it was just a lot more diverse. Um, and I, I do think, you know, I think in terms of the vibe, kind of answering your last question of um, how did it become such a hotbed for musicians, I really do think it's it's the atmosphere that that Nancy and the other folks um, at the Atomic really created. And so I think while, you know, it was very LA, very diverse at the same time, it did have 
uh, at least what you know we were told it had a very um, free feeling people you know could be who they were without judgment and in a way that was you know kind of a nice haven uh, within within the community so just within the city itself and yeah, Nancy, thanks for that yeah go ahead I was just gonna say Nancy also was a musician she she was one of the original members of the band Hiroshima which is probably regarded as like the most well-known Japanese American band that has ever existed um, she, she was a member before they kind of became famous, but, um, you know, so she always had that in her blood. And so, you know, musicians are, you know, they're going to attract other musicians and she's the one that turned up the jukebox and that's what drew in so many other, you know, not, not only musicians, but also a lot of music fans. Mm -hmm. And, and she intentionally created this haven for, her um, band of misfits, you know, all, all of her friends that she regarded as kind of outsiders and misfits in that, in that eclectic sort of artistic community. Yeah, so, so my question about were uh, some uh, Japanese Americans uh, uh, maybe scared by the clientele there. I, I asked that because uh, I have a good friend who's father was a Japanese American pastor at one of the churches in little Tokyo. And so his, his father basically told him to stay away from the atomic cafe. And, and so I, I guess I'm wondering, you know, for, for, uh, for some of the Japanese American residents of little Tokyo, were, were they even scared of, of the place uh, and what was going on there? I think, I mean, I think that just speaks to the diversity and spectrum within the Japanese American community, right? Or especially at least in Los Angeles, but I'm assuming in other communities. It's just, yeah, there's there's a huge spectrum. Um, and, you know, I think some are, some probably would be intimidated um, or feel like it's not their space. And I think that's probably even more of a reason why um, the people who went to the Atomic felt it was their space. Because they definitely felt, or they definitely felt it was, kind of theirs and not necessarily a mainstream space, let alone a kind of mainstream Japanese American space. So I think it just it just speaks to kind of the diversity within the community. Yeah, thanks. That's that's a very good observation, an important point. Okay, well thank you to uh, directors Todd Tad Nakamura and Akita Bach. So the next film is Parabola with uh, the director Lee Shorten. And uh, the topic of the film uh, is a Japanese American criminal who uh, is released, uh, a compassionate release later in life. He's in prison and he's released. And so I, I, I'm interested in why it's important to have a film about a Japanese American criminal. And then uh, Lee, your background uh, is as a lawyer. And I'm wondering if that influenced your your work on this film and uh not everyone in the audience will have seen the film yet but uh, without spoiling the plot uh i'm wondering if you can explain the t story in general terms i found it fascinating but i'm not sure that i completely understood it so uh please <laughs> jump in on any of those uh on any of those questions lee uh thank you look i, I a friend of mine often jokes that every time you see a Japanese person in Western cinema, it's either they're either Yakuza or Samurai. And they're always these two dimensional characters that are foils, you know, or sidekicks and, and, and they don't really have any depth or complexity. And, you know, I had grown up on a lot of Italian gangster films, but, you know, the beauty of Italian gangster films is you see, a range of characters and, and you understand them and they're the protagonists and you see the complexities of the human condition. So I wanted to tackle the Yakuza from the same perspective. I wanted to give them the depth and humanity and complexity that we've seen um, from, from our white counterparts. And a lot of it too, you know, the genesis of this movie was, I had two actor friends who were the, the ladies of the movie, Mayumi Yoshida and uh, Hiro Kanagawa. And Hiro in particular had, had played so many crime lords over his career. So it was like, how could we subvert the expectations around his appearance? And how could we allow him to draw upon his entire body of work and do something new and rich 
with it. Um, so hopefully um, a lot of that translates. In, in terms of uh, my background as a lawyer, uh, no, not really, to be honest. Um, my main focus was the very dry topics of uh, contracts and tax. So <laughs> I, uh, it didn't really, um, didn't really influence the writing of this per se. And then in terms of the film, without giving too much of it away, um, yeah, look, I mean, like the basic premise is, yeah, this dying, this dying Yakuza hitman is released from prison. And then, you know, he tries to reconnect with, with his estranged daughter and, and his grandson. And it, it has a somewhat ambiguous ending. Um, but, you know, I like to think, you know, my friend said screenwriting is like math. Um, and hopefully if you've done it right, then it all adds up. So, you know, if I say to you two plus two, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to say the answer is four. You just know it's four. So uh, I keep, my film is supposed to be the two plus two, and then you're free to add your four on, onto the ending. Um, and the title parabola is also perhaps a hint about, you know, the nature of their relationship and, and about sort of the, the themes um, that the film is dealing with. Thanks. So uh, in the minute we have left, I'm wondering how you migrated from law uh, into uh, filmmaking and acting. Uh yeah, so, so I did film studies as my uh, liberal arts undergrad major, and it's an industry that I, I've always loved. Like this, I've always had great passion for, it. but you know, you, you graduate high school and there's an expectation, <laughs> as stereotypical as it is, that you'll be a lawyer or a doctor. So, so I, I did that and then I, I just never was satisfied. So I was approaching my 30th birthday and I thought if I don't take this leap now, I, I will never do it. So I, I just quit my job and took a leap of faith. Thanks. So that's uh, director Lee Shorten for, uh, from the film Parabola. And the next uh, uh, film is Fugetsudo by uh, director Kaya Rose. And uh, my questions are, uh, one of your previous films was on climate change and this film is on a Japanese uh, confectionery. So uh, why did you take your family connection to Fugetsudo and make it into a film? And uh, why do you think uh, Fugetsudo survived for over 400 years, for, for over 100 years in Little Tokyo when the only other surviving business is a mortuary? So there's basically these two businesses, uh, Fugetsudo and a mortuary that uh, survived this long. So, uh, any thoughts on those uh, questions, Kaya? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for the questions and thanks for having me. Um, well, it, yeah, it's true. Most of my other work actually is uh, has been about climate change recently, um, and continues to be. It's kind of the the main the, the main focus that I have taken on in my career. Um, I, but the the project for Forget to Do was um, kind of simmering in the back of my mind for a number of years. And um, it's kind of been a, a, a endeavor of love that I've really put a lot into it. Um, my mom is a native Angelino and we, you know, I lived in England for a long time and every time I'd come back for the holidays, the first stop would always be we get to go to get some mochigashi. Um, and there's just something I, I'm, I'm sure some, I'm, I'm not sure if the audience has been there, if, if anyone knows the store, but, um, there's something about it that really just drew me in. And I couldn't even quite place what it was, you know, like it, it's not that it's done up to be really cute or anything like that, but it just has this essence to it that really um, intrigued me. And, you know, I could, I could spend, you know, hours in there if they let me, but they, <laughs> it's a pretty small space. So I think they'd kick me out at a certain point. Um, and then I learned, you know, a little bit more about the story of the Quito family who's been running it for now for three generations, going on four generations. Um, and I met Brian Quito, who's the current owner, and he's a wonderful storyteller and also has this like beautifully resonant voice. And it kind of suddenly the, the visuals in the store and, and his voice started kind of coalescing into a film idea um, that I thought was an important one to tell. Um, 
And I think, you know, as a someone from California, and I lived, lived in England long, for a long time, as I said, and things are very old in England. You know, you come across stores that have been there for 400 years, as you, as you mistakenly said, right? Um, but in California, we don't have a lot of old things. Like it, it's, you know, 117 years is, it's pretty old as far as California goes and, and as far as Los Angeles as a whole goes. So I, I kind of like this idea of, of this, this kind of anchor point for the little Tokyo community and, and just thinking about how much the store has seen and how much the Kito family has gone through and, and how it's kind of all wrapped up in these beautiful little sweets, these colorful sweet things that bring joy to people, um, which I think is part of why they have survived, you know, um, whereas other businesses, it, you know, it's, it's been a hard place to do business, I think, in Little Tokyo. Obviously, during World War II, you know, families lost everything and the Quito family lost everything. And then they, when they came back to Los Angeles after the war, they were, they were incarcerated at Heart Mountain. And when they got back to Los Angeles, it took a long time, but they started the business again and they kept going, which is unusual. Um, and then during the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, you know, it was also a really hard place to do business. And Brian talks about that in the film that he kind of again and again thought about closing the store. And there was just something that made him keep going. And, and he talks about the store, you know, the store itself having this kind of passion to exist. And, uh, you know, when he, when he said that to me in the interview, I was like, that's what drew me in, I think, is it's like, it's become more than just a little candy store now. It's, it's really its own being. <laughs> and, it, and it kind of, all of those memories of, you know, really joyful memories and these wonderful cu cultural memories and traditional memories, and, but also memories of loss and discrimination, they're all kind of wrapped up in these little beautiful handmade, you know, sweets that, that not many people know how to make anymore. Mm -hmm. Brian says, even in Japan, uh, some of those traditions are being lost. And, and there's very few people in the US. I, I think, as far as I know, it's just the Getsudo in, in LA and Ben Kyodo in San Francisco that still do the traditional handmade mochigashi. So um, yeah, it's definitely, it was a turn of kind of topic for me, but it was something that was personally, I just felt like I couldn't, I couldn't let that project drop away because it was a story that just drew me in and keeps drawing me in. Yeah, thanks. And, and, you know, there's certainly a social justice theme there about, uh, and a historical lesson about internment and uh, that uh, this family was making mochi in, in Heart Mountain internment camp. People collected their rights and brought them to that. So, I mean, it just shows how uh, Japanese Americans coped in the camp, trying to make life as normal as possible, having scouts and baseball and school and uh, mochi. So th thank you for that. And th the the film was beautiful. I, I you know, My son lives in Los Angeles. And I know where I'm going uh, as soon as I'm able to go again is uh, forget to do. So thank you, Kairos, for that film. So uh, the, the final film is Sansei Granddaughters. Uh, directors Naomi Judy Shintani and Ellen Bepp will be speaking on behalf of the other directors. And uh, this film on uh, Japanese American World War II incarceration is relevant to current race-based exclusion. Uh, for example, the artwork involving incarcerated children evokes images of children at the U.S. border separated from their parents. So I'm wondering how uh, can your art prevent the repetition of past mistakes. So uh, uh, Naomi or uh, Ellen, uh, please, uh, please jump in. Um, Ellen, do you want to go first? No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, all of all of us are um, artists, and we took the journey to um, understand more our own family history. And all of it, all of us have brought our own way of unraveling these memories and and um, a lot of stories that haven't been told by our elders and our ancestors. And I think just the telling of the stories alone and um, depicting 
the uh, histories and memories is, is a way of helping to prevent the um, repetition of past histories by bringing the, the um, personal as political, I would say. And um, as I was working on the dream refuge um, of sleeping children, I, I just couldn't help but connect it to what's happening right now and healthy uh, with the asylum seeking children. And um, I just, I believe the connection of our histories and our personal stories and our voices, that is the way that we can um, uh, prevent people from being the other, but being ourselves. So I, I just, uh, all of us had our own way of telling our stories and doing rituals together in the film. And um, I've had a lot of people that have seen our, the film and, and my work and didn't even realize that there were whole families in the camps, uh, which I could connect with what Lisa was talking about in her film. So Ellen? Um, did you want to talk a little bit about the, the actual dream refuge? Um, more, more details about that or? Well, I could, I could talk a little bit more about that. I mean, it, the, uh, the, uh, the idea was um, making sleeping children, life-size sleeping children that were drawn on mattresses. And uh, I enter uh, in the center of these sleeping children on cots were uh, the asylum seeking children that were placed on the ground. I did interview quite a few um, people, including uh, Japanese Americans who were uh, incarcerated as well as uh, I collected stories of children that were uh, in the detention centers. And uh, one of the, the Honduran mothers said, please don't put them on beds. Uh, um, put them on the ground. So they're placed on the ground on the mylar blankets. And, um, and the idea of connecting the stories was very um, moving for a lot of people that came to see the exhibit. And I did take one of the cots out to Mansmar um, with me when I, um, we all brought one or two pieces of our work to put in the actual environment of Mansmar and was quite moving to be on the actual ground and with the mountains and the um, and the uh, camp in the background and, the, and just be in the exact area where that history had happened. And we actually were able to do some rituals in the area where um, Reiko Fuji's family, their actual um, barrack location um, was located. And, and that was very um, touching for all of us, I believe. And the only other thing um, that I, I'd like to add is that um, I guess, you know, we didn't really intend to do a documentary to, to um, share so broadly as, as this film is starting to be shown. Um, it was really, at least for me, it was more of a personal journey. And what we all had in common was um, we all had, um, relatives, we, none of us were in camp ourselves, but we had relatives, parents, grandparents, and others who, who were in the different camps. And um, we wanted to find a way to not only honor what they and the other 120,000 people um, experienced, but um, find a way through our art to sort of create ritual, to, to create ceremony and make some connection with our ancestors. Um, so that was really, for me, it was, it was very moving. Um, you know, you kind of have this idea in your mind, but once you get there and we were on the, the like Naomi said, we we're on the exact land where the barracks were that I think all of Reiko Fuji's family uh, were sent there. And um, it was, that was one, memorable part. And then the other was, as you'll see in the um, documentary, we're five very different artists and, and our um, whole approach to art is quite different, but we all had something to say. And so we sort of merged all our voices in this film. And um, 
I think, you know, it gave us um, a megaphone to really, to really get our feelings out and to, um, and that was the key also, it was feelings, it wasn't just words. Um, and we hope that the audience will, will um, feel what we were feeling as well. I think it's pretty powerful. Oh, it, it is very powerful. Thank, thank you, uh, Naomi and Ellen and Rico and Kathy and Sherry for that powerful film. So uh, my mother-in-law and father-in-law actually met in Manzanar. They uh, were working in the children's village. And so I visited Manzanar and it's a very desolate, dusty place as all the camps are. But I, I really felt that your art brought a dignity to that place. Uh, and and just uh, you know, I, I think you did accomplish what you wanted to accomplish in this uh, very important documentary. So so uh, now I want to move to your your next uh, project. So we'll just go one by one, uh, uh, starting with uh, Lisa Maeda, director of Hanami. Lisa, what are your next uh, projects? Yeah, so I'm currently working on an animation pitch called Detroit Kimono. Um, and as opposed to Hanami, this is supposed to focus more on a modern Japanese American experience where a young girl is um, uh, searching through her attic and she finds a bunch of Japanese relics and uh, she, she sort of connects with them in a way that she didn't know um, too much about our culture because she's very American. Um, so she's able to have this sort of sense of self discovery. Um, so yeah, I'm working on that right now. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, Tad and Akita from Atomic Cafe, what are your next projects? Um, currently working on a documentary on um, my father, who uh, was a pioneering uh, Asian American filmmaker, um, Robert Nakamura. Uh, he was actually uh, one of the children featured in Naomi's um, Dream Refuge installation. So it's nice, it's definitely small, small community. Um, but it's about um, about his career, uh, about his life, uh, as well as uh, his current battle with Parkinson's, um, as well as um, his relation, my relationship with him as you know, both of us um, being filmmakers. Thanks. Uh, Akita, uh, go ahead. So I'm starting to work on a, a documentary about an, uh, an Issei artist whose name was Wakaji Matsumoto. And he was a photographer that was um, part of a very vibrant artistic community that existed in Little Tokyo before the war in the 1920s and 30s. And his work was completely unknown um, because he, he did a lot of photography in LA, but then moved to Hiroshima in the late 1930s. Pretty bad timing, but um, good in the sense that he actually documented a lot of life in, uh, in Hiroshima before the atomic bomb. And his uh, photographs were miraculously saved and rediscovered um, somewhat recently by his family members. So that's one of the projects I'm working on. Great, thank you. And uh, Lee Shorten, uh, Parabola, what, what are your next uh, projects, Lee? Uh, so interestingly, I, I'm actually part Korean as well. Um, and so I know historically our, our countries have a lot of interesting history. So I, I'm actually working on a, a f like a modern day feature about a sort of a gang war between a, a Korean and Japanese gang that's sort of using the modern context to to kind of explore a bit of the of the history, but translated to, you know, the, the modern context. So it's not historically accurate and it's a bit removed and can be a bit more abstract and, and metaphorical. Thanks. And uh, Kaya Rose on Pagetsudo, what are your next projects? Yeah, well, um, as you mentioned, I, I do a lot of climate communication. I'm kind of doing that full time at the moment, which is part of the reason why it took me so long to finish Forget to Do. <laughs> um, but I, I do have, now that I have this film done, um, I'm turning my scopes to finishing editing a, a short doc that I actually filmed before Forget to Do. It's another LA focused um, kind of, again, getting drawn into something. I'm not, I can't quite explain why, but. Um, it's me and my mom 
driving the full length of Sepulveda Boulevard and kind of going through LA history and kind of um, our like the portrait of our relationship and and um, I'm not actually sure what it's going to turn out to be yet so it's going to be a bit of a surprise to me as well but um, definitely kind of looking again at uh, LA and, and history and how kind of our, our present lives are informed by, by the past, really. Thanks. And uh, any of the five Sunset granddaughters directors, so your artists who, I guess, happen to make a great documentary, uh, are you planning to make uh, more films or uh, any, any of you can chime in on this one? Does anyone want to talk? <laughs> As, as our group, I know, as far as I know, we don't have any plans, but, um, but I'd like to plug um, a documentary that I'm going to be in that's going to be coming out hopefully in the next couple of months. And um, it's, it's a story, ba I, to backtrack, I um, participate in a multicultural, multi-generational um, uh, relationship with a youth art center called Destiny Arts in Oakland. And um, I'm in a group called the Elders Group. And we work with teens and we collaborate on um, social justice issues. And, and we're going to be working on a piece called The Black Hole. And um, it's a combination of spoken word, hip hop, and performance, and a whole story behind six young people who were killed tragically um, in the last 15, 20 years. And how do we honor young people who, who are killed and die before, before they even live their lives? So um, that's coming out hopefully very soon. Thanks, anyone else from uh, the Sunsea Granddaughters uh, film want to uh... Um, I'll say I'll say something. Uh, I've been working on um, a documentary called "Detained Alien Enemies," and it's based on um, going around to different people, my relatives, acquaintances, and and getting um, a sense of uh, their perspective on being in the camps. And it's uh, everybody has their own story; it, they're all different, and so. Um, in this documentary, I, um, I have more footage that I want to add to um, what I have already, and I, um, I really want it to be professionally edited. So that is probably going to come up in the next couple of years as a, hopefully, a finished project. Uh, well, I, I always wanted to talk about how I'm taking the Dream Refuge, which was an installation, an art installation of um, a, a safe place for children who have gone through these traumatic experiences. And I'm going, and I it, it had recordings and music and installation. And um, I've done a ritual outside with uh, live music and, and storytelling. Actually, Ellen was part of that. And the next um, iteration, I'm going to be doing a, it's going to be installation at the Monterey Museum of Art and uh, I'm going to it's going to be um, including projection and stories again but it's what are what are these children dreaming so what 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 are, what are they dreaming for their future okay thanks anyone else from Sunset Granddaughters Okay, thank you for spending time with the disoriented audience and uh, making films that enlighten us about Japanese Americans. And to those in the audience, uh, follow these directors and support their work. And also make sure you rate all the films you see because your favorite film could receive an audience choice award. And to the filmmakers here, continued success to all of you. And again, thank you for spending time with us. And I, I wish we had more time to chat uh, among ourselves uh, at the festival. When it's in person, we have lots of time just to interact and uh, a little more time to talk with each other. But thanks for taking time to do this and uh, uh, just making the 20 
2021 Disorient uh, Asian American Film Festival uh, richer because of your presence. So thank you and uh, uh, goodbye. Thank you. 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 Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.